Um, so, so we're going to change gears now and we'll talk about uh, regression methods, right? One of the reasons why we're going to spend a little more time talking about regression methods is that for the bulk of the class, right? These are fairly new methods that a lot of people have not encountered. So, so we're going to spend a little more time talking about rev revising this as you go. And what we're going to do is that we're going to use linear regression as a framework. Right, we talked at, at the beginning of the, um, when we talked about linear regression, we said that it is critical to use linear regression to understand the other regression methods, okay? And so what, what, what I want you to do is that as we go about this, okay, somebody asked us to go over the two by two table. And so now I feel compelled. Now two by two table was not, one of the things that we had planned to talk about, but I am going to just pull up a slide very quick. Okay, let's do this. Let's keep going. I'll talk about the two by two table after we take a break. So we'll talk about linear regression quick for a while. And then when we come back, before we keep going, we'll talk about the two by two table, then we'll pick it up. Okay. All right. So regression methods. Okay. And we went very quickly through these methods. This is a summary of everything that we learned on the regression methods, right? I think the other thing that is also important here is how we interpret, and that's here. Okay, okay, all right. So, so in linear regression, um, can somebody tell us when is an appropriate time to use linear regression? Anyone? When would you use linear regression as opposed to anything else? Hello, sir. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Uh, when you are comparing two continuous variables that are correlated. Yes. Excellent example. You have two continuous variables. They are correlated. And you want to see whether as one increases, does the other increase? Excellent example. So that's the, the, the setting in which we're often thinking about linear, linear regression. So I'm going to ask, are there other times when we use linear regression? Does, do both variables have to be continuous? That's the question that I have. Anyone? No, sir. Um, sorry, I think I accidentally unmuted him. Accelerate me, tell him. Yeah, can you unmute yourself again? Yes, sir. Okay. When the dependent variable is continuous, and uh, the independent variable can either be continuous or categorical. Can continuous or categorical? Very good. So, what is the dependent variable? Let somebody else tell us. What is the dependent variable, and what is the independent variable? So what is the dependent variable? What is the independent variable? Somebody else wants to tell us? The dependent variable. No, let, let my dear go ahead, yes. Okay. All right, the dependent variable is the response variable. Okay. While the independent variable is the explanatory and the predictor variable. Okay, very good. You've given us more words, all right? But before you give us more words, those words are correct, okay? They're very correct. But can you say it in plain English? Right. If you have a study, which, what is it? Maybe you can use an example if you like. Okay. All right. In a study, let's say, to check, I don't know. Let someone try, please. Okay. All right. Um, somebody else wants to try. Maybe you are trying to compare weight and height. Weight and weight, height. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the weight is dependent on the height, but usually the height is not dependent on the weight of a patient. For example, okay. you want to, yes, the height of a patient can contribute to the weight of a patient. Okay. But the, so that height there, is uh, is an independent is predict 
the weight of the patient, which is the outcome or the dependent variable. Okay, excellent, excellent. That, that, that's very good. That, that's, that's a very good way to think about it. The weight, okay, can be explained by the height, or you can say that the height of a person influences the weight that they have, right? I mean, this is not general rule. I mean, this is not like an absolute rule rather, but this is on average. A person's height will predict the weight that they have. You might have people that are not tall, but you know, that are big, but when a person is tall, it's more likely that they're going to be big, that kind of thing. Um, and your study wants to understand to what extent this relationship exists, right? So you, the, <clears throat> the dependent variable that you're trying to explain is the weight. And the independent variable that you're using to explain it is the height. So that independent variable is also known as the predictor and the explanatory variable, excellent. All right, um, so, so that, that's linear regression. Basically, we've just gone through linear regression very quickly. Um, so the, the other thing uh, before we go is logistic regression. Somebody else wants to tell us, when do we use logistic regression? And is there anyone else who has not spoken at all today that just wants to you know, break out from the silence and just go for it? Logistic regression. When do you use logistic regression? Anyone? Logistic regression is used when you have a um, dependent variable that is um, categorical and an independent variable that is um, either categorical or continuous. Or continuous. Okay, very good. So is it categorical variable? If it's a binary logistic regression, which is the one that we saw in class, is it any type of categorical variable? Or is there a particular type of categorical variable? Yes, for binary logistic regression, if the category if the categorical variable is binary, as in like yes or no, um, good or bad. Yeah. yeah. And how do we code it? <clears throat> how do we the data that you're going to feed into the software? How do you have to code it? Maybe zero for one and one for the other one. Exactly, zero and one. That's the way to think about it. And, that, and so when we are interpreting it, we're thinking about going from zero to one. Okay, we're thinking about going from zero to one. Um, so that is binary logistic regression. So the other type of um, regression method that we saw was a Poisson regression. So in this one, I want you to give a diff, I want to have a different approach. I want you to think about examples, okay? Think about examples. In what kind of condition, you know, would you use a Poisson regression? And you can, you can use an example that was seen in class or you can think about something different. Poisson regression, when would you use it? I want you to use an example to bring it to life. If you remember, we said that <clears throat> um, we said that for a for a linear regression, you need a continuous variable as the outcome. But for a Poisson regression, you need a count variable. And earlier, someone told us what count variables are. So they're typically integers, right? And they give us examples of count variables, like the number of people in this class. Okay, that's a count variable. So for Poisson regression, we will typically start with a count variable and we might factor in time, okay? And we might factor in time. So the first question I'm asking is, what is an example of when we would use a Poisson regression? It's basically think about the examples that you know about count variables and talk about the research question that you might want that you think is possible as a result of it. So wait. 
maybe the number of deaths that is recorded as a result of a particular disease. The number of deaths recorded as a result of a particular disease. Okay. Someone said okay. when you need to count the number of times an event occurs, such as a birth rate, you know, so that, that's another way to think about. So the number of deaths. So say, for instance, you, uh, you have a new drug for HIV patients. Okay. Um, and so that the new drug for HIV patients, right? It, some of, you're told that, or from your biology, you believe that this drug is going to lower the number of deaths. And so you're going to, you want to do the analysis, you might use a Poisson regression to examine the number of deaths. So somebody has a question. Dahiru, you have a question? All right, so let's keep going. I think he's trying to unmute himself. Um, so, so one question that you might get is that, go ahead, yes. I see you unmuted yourself. I, you want to speak up now? All right. So it's okay. it's yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's okay now. I'm getting, I'm getting, sorry. Okay, excellent. You know, so, so one question you might get um, is that, oh, you, maybe you shouldn't be thinking about all deaths at any point in time. So for instance, there might be the issue of, right, all these deaths, if you're comparing deaths, someone might say that, maybe the deaths caused by the, or the deaths in the people who received the drug versus those who didn't receive the drug. It could be that those who didn't receive the drug, many of the deaths occurred in the first year and then the people don't die anymore. But the people who received the drug, they continue to have deaths into like multiple years, right? And maybe this is a five year study, okay? So, so take for example, uh, Paxlovid, which is the COVID-19 drug. I don't know if many of you know. People are finding that, when you use that drug, right, it, it sort of keeps the viruses away, but it doesn't fully like eliminate them. So when you get tested, the, you know, the viral load might go down for the COVID-19. And once the person starts feeling well, two or three weeks later, the virus comes up again and then they start feeling unwell. So it might be that maybe the drug that you've introduced, this new fancy HIV drug that you've introduced, is helping people to essentially defy the number of deaths over time. And so time becomes an important factor. And we said that it is important to factor in time, okay? When you're thinking about Poisson regression, okay? So, so that, that's the other thing. And so we said that you can compare rates We're using Poisson regression, but you can also compare time. And we said that this, term in the, in the model, and we said that when you introduce time into the model, and we called it one word. Does anybody remember what we called it? We said that when you introduce, the word, the, you introduce time into the model, we're using time as something so that that allows us to, to analyze the result as a rate. Anyone? You can unmute yourself and go for it. You said? Anyone? And I, I and I remember cracking the joke about the name of one musician. Offset. Offset. Yes, we can call it. That's what it's called. It's called an offset. Okay. All right, so this term is called an offset, an offset term. And, you know, um, it's essentially a way for us to account for the time in the model, okay? All right, the final one is Cox proportional hazards model. So who can tell us when we can use this one? And then we'll take a break.
Any examples of when to use a Cox model? Anyone, even if you've spoken today. Did we say that it's a, when we have a time to event outcome? Yeah. So what is the time to event outcome? As we gather, you wanted to say something. Well, I wanted to say that um, I, I think I remember something about adjusting for confounders. Um, yes. You use Cox proportional. Um, um, yes, that is correct. Cox proportional hazards model. We said that, excellent. So we said that if you're looking at the survival analysis, right, you have a survival analysis that you've done you've compared two times to event out, out, um, outcomes, or let me, give, let, let me give an example since we're already going into it. Say, for example, you want to see whether, so let's take the, the, the drug that we just talked about, HIV. So, you know, you can check, you can count the number of deaths and look at whether the number of deaths differs in the group who got the drugs and the group who got the placebo. That's one way to do, do the analysis. And if you do the analysis that way, you can use a Poisson regression. But another way to do the analysis is to look at how quickly did the death occur, okay? And remember I gave the example that maybe some people, maybe some in one group, the deaths are occurring early, but in the other group, the deaths are occurring late, right? In the Cox proportional hazard model, the outcome is the time to when the events occurred. It's not the number of events. It's the time to when the events occurred, right? So if the events occurring earlier, then that means that the hazard is greater. If the events occurring late, so, so the, the Cox proportional hazard model assumes that everybody is going to get the outcome. And often you think about in the context of death, everybody's going to die. The question is, when are you going to die? Okay, so if you think that everybody's going to get the outcome, whether they get it during your study or after your study, okay? But you want to see if, if, it is, if there is a way for you to make them get it later rather than earlier, then you would use a Cox proportional hazards model. And while you're doing that, and if you want to adjust for confounding while doing that, this is the great, this is, you use, use this me method. Or if you want to obtain a hazard ratio, you would also use the Cox proportional hazard model. Any questions before we take a five minute break? Any questions? All right, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back. We'll talk about the two, two by two table and then we'll keep going. All right, so, all right, welcome back. Um, Let's keep going. Okay, so the two by two table, let's talk about the two by two table. So the two by two table is essentially a way for us to represent the occurrence of a disease, you know, in relation to the exposure. And this is a setting in which is most often used in epidemiology, right? But we could also use it in other settings too, where we're looking at one variable and the next, right? Where you have maybe a binary variable where um, has this person had his, had his bath today? Yes or no? Has this person eaten, had breakfast today? Yes or no? So that's another way that we use it, you know, a binary variable of some sort or a categorical variable of some sort. In which case you have, you can think about like a Venn diagram where there, it's not mutually exclusive. You know, a person can fit multiple categories. They can either have the disease and have been exposed, or they might not have the disease and have been exposed, right? Or they might have the disease and not had the exposure. So an example could be smoking. And smoking is a very, very good example 
to present there. So smoking and lung cancer, right? Not everybody who smokes gets lung cancer. And not everybody who has lung cancer was a smoker, okay? So a person could have lung cancer, you know, and be a smoker. So a smoker who has lung cancer will fit here. Yeah, so you count the number. So if you have a population of maybe 10,000 people and you know the smoking status of everybody and you know whether they have lung cancer, right? If you have maybe five people who had lung cancer and who were smokers, then they will fit here, you know? And maybe you have 200 other people who, who were smokers, but never had lung cancer. Those who go here. Okay, and then you might also have people who never smoked, but some of them long, had lung cancer. Maybe that's 50 people, right? And then you have all these other people who are left, who, you know, didn't smoke and never had lung cancer and they will go here, right? So essentially, if you add this A, B, C, and D together, you will get the total number of people in the population. This is really the, a two by two table. You know, it's, it's just that straightforward. And you can add the totals on the ends, right? Which is basically this A and B, which is everybody who was exposed. And this one is C and D, which is everybody who was not exposed, right? And you can add A and C and B and D. All right, any questions? I know someone asked for two by two table, but I want to know whether this is as far as they're interested in or do they want some more detail or exactly what clarification they need. Yep, should I keep going? All right, so we, we also used the two by two table to motivate the chi-square, the chi-square test. And so instead of using A, B, C, and D, we, we use this nomenclature, D1, D0, H1. And that's because we can then use this nomenclature in this formula. This is, this is the formula for chi-square, this one. That, you know, and we can use that, just plug in the numbers and then you get the chi-square and then you can read this off in the statistical table. And you remember I said that all of these statistical tables, you, there's the online version, right? That you can, you can just plug numbers into a website and it'll give you the p-value, okay? All right, so let's keep going. Let's go back to the slides that we're looking at. So before the break, we were looking at different types of regression methods with linear, binary, logistic, Poisson, Cox, and people gave examples, right? And, and one of the things that I wanted to quickly point out is that if you remember from physics class, right? They taught us this equation of a straight line. And this equation of the straight line is the basis for linear regression, right? And it's also the basis on which we understand and interpret the rest of the regression methods. Okay, so the idea is that you, you have numbers on a scatter plot and you're trying to find the line of best fit. And that this is the line of best fit. And this slope is the beta. The beta estimate that we are always interpreting is the slope, okay? And this is the intercept. So this is beta one and this intercept is beta zero, okay? And that's beta zero. Okay, and that's what we are trying to implement. And if you look in on this equation of the straight line, this is beta zero, this C, and this is beta one. And we looked at that when we looked at linear regression. Okay, we earlier talked about predictor, explanatory, independent variable. We talked about response or dependent, the slope, or which is also the slope is also the effect and the intercept. Okay, all right. So we, we can take, this example, or we can keep going and go talk about other things. All right, let's take this example. So you're interested in assessing, this is an example we've seen in class. You're interested in assessing whether there's a difference between the number of years spent in residency training 
and the number of hours usually work per week. The, the, the assumption is that maybe if a person has spent more years in residency training, they might have more control over their time or they might have more responsibility. That means that they have, they're expected to work even longer hours. So it depends on what's happening in your setting. But the key thing to remember is that these, are, these two are continuous variables. So the number of years is measured maybe 0 0.5, 2.5, 0 0.6, that kind of thing. It's not measured in whole numbers. And number of hours too is, is a continuous variable in this setting, right? So you have a regression model that looks like this, okay? And the question that I really wanna ask is how do you interpret the beta estimates? So how do you interpret beta zero? Anyone want to tell us? How do you interpret beta zero? Anyone? Um, hello, can beta, I talk? Beta zero is the intercept. The intercept. It's the hours worked when the residency year is zero. When the residency year is zero. Okay, very good. Uh, Batsune, I think you wanted to speak up earlier. Can you tell us what beta one is? Um, um, I, I, like you said, that's the intercept and uh, that's the um, number of hours uh, for which a resident will work, even if the person starts in on day one. Even if the person starts on day one. Excellent. So when the residency years is zero. Don't go yet. Don't go yet. So that is beta zero. All right. Um, so what is beta one about today? So uh, the beta one there is um, the slope that is the um, the coefficient that determines, or let let me say a factor that is multiplied by the um, number of residents, um, number of uh, resident years. Okay. So that uh, determines the hours work. Okay, so, but here's the thing. If you want to interpret it, okay, what would it be? As the number of residency years increases by one, right? Um, let's one of... let's try it. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay. All right. Sir, can I try? Let, let's have somebody else, have sorry, somebody else. so that we can have sorry. more people talk. I, I, I really like your enthusiasm. Um, let, let, maybe let's, let's have somebody else attempt it from the class. And then if, they don't, if we don't have anybody else, then you give it a shot. Anyone else in the class wants to try? Okay, um, let me try now. Okay. Um, for every um, unit of resident years, uh, we have um, the hours work increased by a factor of one. You're getting very close. For every unit increase in residency years, the hours work increases by beta one. Okay. Yes. Every time the residency years increases by one, the hours work increases by beta one. So that so even though the beta one is on this side of the table of the equation, it actually refers to it's what is a factor that you multiplied by the hours worked, like you said earlier. So every time the residency years increases by one. So if you compare the person, you know, who was on the first day of residency, residency day is day one or day zero, and compared to residency after one year, right? How much different is the number of hours they would work? And we looked at that here earlier, uh, you know, and, and we found that that beta coefficient in this study was 0 0.97, right? That means that if on average, and you remember like, um, like Lawal said, that um, that the constant is the residence is the number of hours worked on day zero. Okay, the constant is the number of hours worked on day zero. 
right? So that means that if a person was starting residency and the first week of their residency, they're going to be working 70 hours already, okay? And so, but then if you go and ask them in a year's time, how many hours are they working on average, you will find that they will be working 70.062 plus 0.97. So this is about maybe one. So they might be working 71 hours. This is the way to think about it, okay? And if you go and talk to somebody else, you know, who is in the second year, the, the increment over by one year is going to be another 0 0.97 hours. That's what that beta one coefficient means. All right. Okay. Very good. So that's how we interpret. And then I want somebody else to interpret the p value for us. The p value. The p value here is 0 0.17. Anybody else who hasn't spoken today wants to take this super easy question. Anyone else? Anyone who hasn't spoken today? This is the easiest question of the day. I'm just gonna go for it and blow it out of the park. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, uh, sorry, can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Yeah, yeah this is this is Monday. Okay. Yes, uh, I think I love the question too. Very easy. Like you said, let me just give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> like the the, the p-value here is um, 0 0.171, yeah. which uh, of course is greater than 0 0.05. Yeah. And uh, as such, we will, since the value is greater than 0 0.05, uh, it's not, there is no statistically significant relationship. Yes, very the, good. There's no otherwise, if it's less than 0 0.05, then we'll accept yes, we'll accept the null hypothesis. As it is, we'll fail to, uh, I think we'll, we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, <laughs> okay, don't go, don't go yet, <laughs> don't go yet, don't go yet, don't go yet. Okay, yeah. so we fail to reject, yeah, okay. We never accept. Oh, yeah. Okay. We the term accept, we don't use it. We either say reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. I mean it's semantics, right? When you yeah. fail to reject, it's negative, negative, double negative. And so you're really kind of accepting, but that's not the term that we use in statistics. And the reason we don't use that term is because we are in the we're, all we're doing is sort of estimating. We're not sure, okay. right? We're never sure of what we're doing. We're just getting as close as possible to the truth, okay? So every time we want to leave a little wiggle room, you know, so that if it ends up being wrong, they might say, ah, well, we're unsure, okay? Yeah, thanks. All right, yeah, e excellent. All right, so this is interpreting the linear regression. And the last couple of minutes we spent interpreting the continuous, when the predictor is a continuous variable, right? So I want somebody else to give us and tell us how you would interpret. And so let me give you an example. So first of all, before we go, I, want to, I wanted to point out this. Every time that we've written the equation, we've written y, like here, it's just written the, the variable. But the reason why I introduced this is just to let you know that this E sign, this is to tell you that this Y is really on average, okay? It's really on average. So we're not, it's not as if we're talking about the individual person or the individual patient. We're talking about the average of a population. That's the context in which we're doing all of these methods, okay? Something to always remember that everything that we're doing here is on average, is not relating to a specific individual. And the reason why we, we are saying that is that it gives us pause. So in, for instance, <clears throat> in the context of prediction in say machine learning, this is what they do in machine learning, by the way, they use regression methods like linear regression, logistic regression, okay? And then they add up, <clears throat> They add up the beta zero and the beta one multiplied by X 
and they might have maybe 10 variables like that. So beta one, beta two, beta three, beta four, whatever. And, you know, and they add that all of that up to obtain the, this, this Y, right? The average for Y. Now, sometimes when you predict an outcome in machine learning, it doesn't happen the way you expect it to be. And the reason it doesn't happen the way you expect it to be is that the specific individual that you're dealing with might have another factor, which is often called the error term, right? That makes their results different from the average. And so that's why it, it, we have to be always cautious and, um, and humble, you know, be humble with your results. Don't be like, oh, I have this data set. I have perfectly predicted the outcome. And so this is what it's going to be, right? We always have to be humble because especially when we're extending inference from the average to the individual. All right, so let me give you an example here and then someone is going to interpret. If you wanted to look at the difference in the average number of working hours of resident doctors in your community hospital, and somebody said there's a difference between, is there a difference, I want to ask, is there a difference between number of hours worked by females versus males, okay? And when you coded this variable for, for gender, female was one and male was zero, okay? How are you going to interpret the beta one? Again, the female is one, male is zero. How are you going to interpret the beta one? Or are you going to interpret the beta zero? Anyone? Hello, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Um, the beta zero, the beta not. Okay. Is the, the beta not is when um it's a male. When it's a male, why is that? Um, that means it's uh, since it's a binary variable that uh, the males uh, is one and the female is zero. No, the male sorry, is zero. So the male is zero and the female is one. Excellent. So the that means is when beta one x is zero. Is that zero. Is Excellent. Excellent. When beta one x is zero, then you know that which is in the context of males, right? Then that's what you would get for the beta zero. Okay, somebody else wants to tell us for beta one. Thank you. Noah, you want to go? Badrul, you want to go? Anyone else? Anyone wants to go, whether you've spoken today or not. What is beta one? We just were told that the beta zero is, you know, the average for males, right? And so what is beta zero, what is beta one? Anyone wants to try? It's right there on the screen, by the way. We're going to wait until somebody hey. speaks up. OK. Yeah. 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 So what was beta one? Beta one, not beta not. Not beta not. Beta one is the representation for the x will be coded one. Is the what? Can you say that again? What can you say that again? What we coded for one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so don't go yet. Is it the 
is it the increase in you know or the difference between males and females or is it the value for female which one is it okay so 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 that's not exactly correct so be that one is the difference between the female and the male all right so as you go from the zero to the one as you go from the zero to the one that means that as you go from male to female be that one is the change or the difference between the average. So say the working hours in male is 70 hours. The be that one would be something like maybe two hours, in which case the average in females will be 70 plus two. Okay, let me say that again. If the beta zero is 70 hours, and which is, and we said that that is the average in the reference group or the average in the group for which is, you know, the zero, right? The zero group, the reference group. Beta one is the difference between the reference group and the other group, which is a female group, right? The group you're interested in. So as you go from male to female, the difference between the number of working hours on average is that beta one. So if beta zero here is 70, beta one might be two, okay? But if somebody asks you, what is the average working hours in female? It will be 70 plus two. It's not seven, it's not the two that is the working hours in the, in the female, it is 70 plus two. And I think I might have an example here. Right, so this is an example. In this case, you have the average working hours in the, in the male is 74. If you look to a lower here, this table at the end, the beta one is minus 6.6, .6. okay? The beta one is minus 6.6. .6. So obviously it, we're not looking at a situation where females are working negative six hours, right? But what's really happening is that you add 74 plus minus 6.6, .6, that will give you the average working hours in the female. So which in this case comes to like, you know, 68 or something like that. Okay. So let me take that again. The beta zero is the I'm average... I'm the, the beta zero is the average in the male, is the average in the reference group, okay? The beta one is the difference between the group that is the reference group and the group that you care about right now, right? Which is the, the category that you're talking about. Okay? So that, that is the beta one. So if you're interested in the average for the female, you add them together. Okay, all right. So, so that's the binary. Is that clear or do we still have questions? Is it clear or do we have questions? Yeah? It's clear. All right. So what if it's a categorical variable? What if it's a categorical variable? So we're just, in the last few minutes, we're talking about males and females. What if we're talking about BMI? Okay. And maybe hours work. Let's assume, for instance, that, you know, obese people are working different number of hours from normal weight from underweight and your reference group is normal weight, okay? Your reference group is normal weight. If somebody gives you a beta estimate for the obese group, how would you interpret that beta estimate? Anyone wants to give it a shot? Okay, you're interested in how the number of hours worked differs 
by BMI category. Okay. And so for BMI category, you have underweight, normal weight, and overweight. And your reference group is normal weight. Okay. And your reference group is normal weight. For simplicity, I'm using three categories. If you're interested in the beta estimate, so maybe beta one for obese, right? Compared to normal weight, how would you interpret it? First of all, what would be the beta zero? Normal weight is a reference group. What would be the beta zero? Anyone? Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, I think um, the beta zero will be the BMI for the normal weight. Yes, yes. The beta zero will be the BMI for the normal weight. What will be the B beta estimate for the over for the obese group? Anyone? Anyone? What's the beta estimate for the obese group? Yes, excellent. The beta estimate for the obese group will be the difference between the average working hours in the obese group compared to the average working hours in the normal weight group, because the normal weight group is the reference, okay? So it's important to understand like how we interpret the regression output to be able to make sense of it. So that means that if you have a categorical variable that has three categories, normal, overweight, and obese, sorry, normal, underweight, and obese, or underweight, normal, and obese, and normal is the reference group, you will have beta zero, which will be the working hours in the reference group, which is the normal weight, but you will have beta one, which is the working hours in the obese group, but you will also have beta two, which is the working hours in the underweight group. And when you compare the beta estimates for each level of the category, you'll be comparing it to the reference category. So that means that you will compare normal weights, uh, you will compare obese group to the normal group, right? You will also compare the underweight group to the normal group. So that's how we think about that's how we interpret the regression output for the categorical variable, all right? And the same thing occurs for indicator variables. Remember, we said that indicator variables are really categorical variables, but we are presenting it in a way that each one is a separate variable by itself, okay? So I won't spend too much time on that. The other one that I wanted to spend time on a bit is the multiple or multivariable regression where you have more than one variable in the model, okay? When you have more than one variable in the model, the beta zero is the average working hours. So let's take an example where beta one refers to maybe gender, male and female, and beta two refers to maybe seniority senior resident versus junior resident, okay? And we want to look at working hours. The beta zero refers to the average working hours of the individual when beta one X is zero, right? And beta two Z is zero. We're essentially setting everything else to zero. Now, if the beta one X is zero, that means that maybe the person is male, right? In, in the example that we've talked about where female is one. In the, in the example of the senior resident, senior resident is one, junior resident is zero. 
So that means that the individual that the beta zero refers to will be a junior resident. So that means what we're really thinking about for beta zero is a male junior resident on average. Let me take that again. When you have more than one variable, this is multiple variable regression or multiple regression, right? When you have more than one variable, the average that you're interested in for beta zero is the average when you set everything else to zero. When you set the first variable to zero, we set female as the example, where female is one, male is zero, right? That it means that the person that you're talking about here on average is male. For senior residents, we said senior resident is one, junior resident is zero. The person you're talking about here on average is a junior resident. So it means that the beta zero refers to a junior resident who is male, a male junior resident. Is that clear? So let me ask you a question and then let's have somebody, somebody else try. If we're interested in working hours, okay? We're interested in working hours for a married person who has a child, okay? So the one variable, X variable is married, yes or no. If the person is married, then the X is one. If the person is not married, X is zero. The Z variable is whether they have a child or not. If the person has a child, Z is one. If the person does not have a child, Z is zero. Okay, let me take that again. If the person is married, X is one. If the person is not married, X is zero. If the person is, has a child, Z is one. If the person does not have a child, Z is zero. And you're interested in the average working hours and they're all resident doctors. How would you interpret beta zero? Somebody want to try? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I think the beta zero is um, the average um, number of hours worked when the person is not married and does not have a child. Yes, excellent. Person is not married and does not have a child. That is B0. The next question you want to understand is what is B1? What is B1, right? We said B1, somebody want to try? We said X is for someone who is, whether they're married or not married. Let, let, let's have somebody else try. Anyone? Can I try, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I think B1 is the, is the constant for married, for married uh, females. For oh, married? For, the, for married. You said X is when the patient, uh, when, when the resident is married is one, mm -hmm. and when it's not married is zero. Zero, yes. So, so is the number of hours be, is the average number of hours for for married? Is it the average number of hours or what is it? Uh, it will be the no. It is the it is the multiple. The difference. For the married. Okay, the it's difference the, for the, the married. Yeah, the difference for the married compared to. Or compared to the uh, non uh, uh, the single. Compared to the unmarried person, very unmarried, good. Okay. Yes, but the other thing you have to say, because you have the Z in the model, what do you have to say? Don't go Z, yet. Um, okay. Uh, in which the, the resident is married, but not with kids. No, that's not. But you have to say that you're what? Adjusting for? Adjust, adjusting for kids. Yes, adjusting for whether they have kids or not. Kids or not. Okay. Okay. There is a situation where you can do all the adding and you can do all the adding, but that's in the prediction setting, okay? So let's focus yes. on, on this setting where, you know, we're just 
thinking about the one particular variable of interest. This is the causal setting, right? So adjusting for whether they have a child or not. Somebody else wants to try for when, for beta two. If the beta two is what we were interested in and you saw this model, what would you say? Go ahead. Yep. Okay. Um, beta two is the um, the contribution of um, the of whether a um, the contribution of the average number of hours worked, which uh, results to the increment in the number um, average number of average number of numbers um, average number of hours worked mm -hmm. um, when a person has a child adjusting for um, COVID rates X. Yes, adjusting for COVID rates X. So the deep, the increase or the difference, right, in the average number of hours worked when a person has a child compared to if they didn't have the child adjusting for whether they are married or not. This is the way to think about it, okay? This is the way to think about the interpretation. We sp I spent some time on interpretation because if you understand how to interpret the linear regression, then you'll be able to interpret all the others too. All right, so, so I'll skip this. This is, we already looked at this, we already looked at this. And then we looked at other variables, other regression methods. And basically, once you understand everything that we just talked about, you just need to make slight changes in the out in the what's it called that you talk about in the you know in the way that you present your interpretation so for instance if it's a logistic regression instead of saying the difference right you will say the odds so the odds of the variable is higher by you know because now you're talking about in the context of multiples in poisson regression you know, now we're thinking about the mean, right? And, and here as well, we're thinking about the, X. It's, you have to exponentiate, so you're also talking about in multiples. And the same thing in rate and the same thing in the Cox proportional hazards model. But once you understand all that we just went through in the first set, it'll be easy to transmit that, translate that into this setting. And we, we went through this in, in the previous class as well. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to skip this so that I can have a little time to talk about survival analysis. And yeah. So in the last class, we, we went through survival analysis and we spent a little bit of time thinking about the definitions of time to event data. Okay. And, you know, we, we defined three common terms. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an example. And then if anybody wants to just raise their hand and tell us what the target events is, what the time origin is, and what the time scale is. Okay, all right, example. You are an obstetrician and you're conducting a study looking at the effect of zinc supplementation on whether the baby survives or not. And so the baby survival might come in the form of maybe an abortion or a miscarriage, a spontaneous abortion or a miscarriage. It might come in the form of um, you know, a fetal death it might come in the form of a stillbirth, right? Um, but the, up till the time when the child is born, you want to see whether the baby survives. So at the time when the child is born, you stop your study. Again, you start the study from when the woman starts antenatal care, okay? And then you follow them until the time when the child is born, all right? And they're coming to clinic every 
month or you know you're measuring the gestational age in weeks that kind of thing so somebody wants to tell us what the target event is anyone yeah go ahead mm. i think that the target event is the outcome ranging from the um abortion to either a live birth or yep. a fetal death. Right. So the pregnancy loss is the, the target event. Very good. Yeah. Somebody else wants to tell us the time origin. The time origin. Anyone else? Yeah. So when they started antenatal care, clinic that's just the time origin very good anybody else wants to tell us time scale time scale anyone else you could use weeks okay you could use months and varies okay let's take another example and then we'll have a new set of people who haven't you know, who, who haven't participated to, to just um, try. You are interested in, right? Um, you are interested in assessing whether, okay, let, let, me, let me think about this for a moment. You're interested in assessing whether introducing a new teacher and Introducing an extra teacher. So say let's say in the in the community in the schools in your community, in the schools in your community, right? They have there's many schools, and then there, there's complaints that the classrooms are too packed. And I want to use a setting outside of healthcare so that you can see that these methods also translate. People are saying that the this, the method the uh, people are saying that the classes are packed, and you decide to hire an extra teacher for each school, okay? And so when you hire the extra teacher for each school, so you hire an extra teacher for some schools, some other schools, you don't hire an extra teacher. But then all the schools in your community are the schools that you include in your, into your study, okay? And you follow up the kids from all those schools to see how many kids graduate on time okay so whether they go this let's say this is secondary school setting and they have to write an exam at the end of secondary school so you, you're trying to see how many schools graduate on time how many kids graduate on time or how many kids drop out of school okay so can someone tell us what the time origin of this study is so let's say you start this study in the year 2015, right? And then you follow up the kids on up till the time when they graduate and say you conduct the study for five years. So you follow the study. Give it a try. Okay, give it a try. Yes. The time origin is when a child dropped out of school or when he or she graduated. Is, it, is that the time origin? So think about what the time origin is which is supposed to be the beginning, right? You're following up from when you start the study. So somebody else wants to give you this shot. So the, the time origin time is the time origin. you started the, the study yes. itself. The time, the time you started, um, um, the time you started with this, with the, with this, you started the study itself. The time you started the study the is a time origin, yes. Yes. So, because in many, many times when we, um, you know, when you start a study, like the, the way you design the study affects how you define each of these terms. So that's time origin. But the other thing is a target event. Molly, do you want to answer this one? What is a target event? Okay, the target event is um, the graduation of the students or the students that dropped out. Yes, the time when 
the students, the graduation of the students. Yes, that's the target event. Very good. And so what's the time scale? Anyone? Um, I think the time scale is um, from your example, five years period. Yeah. yeah. So is it years or months or days? Anyone that you choose is the time scale. Okay. And remember, we said that sometimes the time scale is not actually real time. It might be mileage, right? In some situations where it makes more sense to not use time, but to use some other skill. All right. So, so, that, so we talked about this extensively. But the other thing that we did talk about was, you know, um, immortal person time. So, and can somebody explain to us what we said immortal person time was? Anyone wants to try? So if you remember, we said that sometimes you start the clock of the study from a period when a person could not have had the outcome, right? Like it's unreasonable. So in the example that we just saw, right? A person can drop out of school anytime. So they might, they, you can start the study in 2015 and they're in GSS one, and something happens to their parents, God forbid, and they stop coming to school, they drop out, or they might drop out in SS3 or you know, in, in the sixth class, that kind of thing. But if you think about in the context of like teenage pregnancy, right? There are kids who start school, before, who start secondary school before they enter puberty. So if you are going to look at it, do a study where your outcome of interest is teenage pregnancy, but you're looking among secondary school girls because it's convenient for you, you would inadvertently include some kids who could not become pregnant because they were not even at puberty yet. You see what I mean? So, so that is immortal person time or immune person time. Another example is you know, where, for instance, you, you include, you're studying HIV patients, okay? Now, for a person to develop a AIDS-related death, they have to first have AIDS. But most HIV patients, when they start, right, they are unlikely to have AIDS-related death at the beginning because at the beginning of, of their infection, the, the, their, the stage of their disease is such that AIDS-related death is unlikely to happen. But it's more convenient for you to include everybody who has HIV infection, maybe at HIV, everybody in your center who has HIV infection. So even though you're including them at that time, it's unlikely that they will have AIDS-related death in the initial years of their disease. That period when they're unlikely to have AIDS-related death is immortal person time. Okay, you're including people into a study at a time when they're unlikely to have the outcome, but you're doing it because it's convenient. And sometimes, you know, one thing to do is to try to avoid including them at that time, you know, maybe include only people who have AIDS at the time of starting the study and then follow them up. That's one way. Or adjust. You can use statistical approaches to try to adjust for the severity of the disease. So you will conduct the study as you do, but you ask people about whether they have AIDS or not. And then you would include that in your model as a confounder. Okay. All right. So that's immortal person time. The other thing we talked about was censoring. Does anybody want to give it a shot? Do you remember what, what we said censoring was? Censoring is when we don't know what happens to the person. Maybe just lost contact or something. We don't even know. The person. Yep. Know. Yep. Excellent. So censoring is when we don't know the outcome that the person experienced. Okay. It might be because we lost contact with them, or it might be because the study ended before they experienced the outcome. Again, we said it might be because we lost contact with them or because 
the study ended before they experienced the outcome. What did we call it when the study ends before they experience the outcome? Anyone? Yes, you've done a study for five years and you're following people up to see whether they die. Hmm. Administrative censoring, very good, okay? Administrative censoring. All right, now we also talked about two different other types of censoring. We said left censoring and right censoring. Does anybody remember and wants to tell us? If you remember, I said one is here and one is here. So I think for the late censoring, the event had occurred before the patient or, or the, the respondent had been recruited. Excellent. So Excellent. That's left censoring. Okay. And what is right well, censoring? Well, for the right, the study has been concluded, then the patient now at the event um not necessarily so it, anytime after you start the study that is right censoring so right censoring is the censoring that we're actually interested in okay um so it might be that the person had the event during the study or this they had the event after the study had ended so that is that is right censoring okay all right very good. So the other thing that we then talked about was the kaplan Mia plot. Um, does somebody want to try to explain this plot to us? Anyone? You're looking at the paper and you see a plot that looks like this. And they said, oh, this was a plot that we got from a study where they followed up you know, resident doctors from the time when the study started for 10 years to see whether they stopped working in that specialty they were training in. How would you interpret this plot? Does it just look like zigzag or? Hello, sir, can I give it a try? Good yes, evening, please, please go ahead. Okay, sir, the Kaplamea plots, uh, the each of this peak here, that's the, uh, uh, okay, let me start with the step. Okay, each of the step here means that uh, one of the participants in the study have had the outcome. Of okay, the one or more, yes, one, one or more, more of the participants mm -hmm. here. Then yep. each of these sticks here uh, represents um, censoring. That's, censoring, yes, excellent. Censoring, that, yes. That's excellent. So that's so basically what it is. There's also something else here. Mm -hmm. Like we can see a place where you're having a, um, a, a step down and then a horizontal tick. This one? Right. Yes, yeah. So this means that at this time, one or more persons are having the outcome of interest. We also have pair one person or so who is also being censored. Censored, very good. Yes, that, 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 this is, that's it. Yeah, that's very well explained. And basically what this says is that you start from, when you start the population, you have everybody in your population. None of them have experienced the event. None of them is censored. But as you go over time, some people either experience the event or, or are censored. And by the end of the study, right, it's either everybody has experienced the event or, or censored, you know, or you don't know whether they, are, they have experienced the event. And so you end the study and administratively censor the rest of the people. So in this particular population, only about 15% of the population ever experienced the event or were censored. That means that 85% of the population, right, never experienced the event. At the end of the, at, at the, end of the study, 85% of the population, you knew that they, they had not experienced the event and you know you could you know where they were you could reach them that kind of thing okay so that's the kaplan mia plot and we said that you can have a 95 percent confidence interval that tells you you know what's the to what how you know like that gives you an idea of if you had repeated this plot many times like repeated this 
this experiment many times in your population, what you would have gotten. But the confidence interval is most valuable for when you are comparing two plots, okay? So can, if you look at these two plots, right, you have males in red and females in, female, in, in blue, which population would you say is experiencing the outcome most often? Anyone? Okay, so can I try again? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I think the males are experiencing the event more. Why is that? Okay, do we have a multiple of the step downs? Having more step downs, yes. More step downs, yes. So, yep, yep. And yeah, so you can and see that it goes down very quickly. Down, yes, yes, sir. Yep. So, so that that's basically what it is. Males are experiencing the event more, but we said that the confidence interval, you know, can help you to see whether this is significantly different. Right. So in this case, we can see that the confidence intervals overlap. So that means that eh, it's not really much different from each other. Right. But the other thing we said is that there is a log rank test. And the log rank test can be used to, to. So sometimes you see this plot, you see two groups or more, two or more groups, and then you see a p value. And somebody will say p equals, you know, 0. Um, zero nine okay this is not supposed to be q <laughs> so you see you see a p value you see a plot like this and they write p equals 0 0.09 and that p value is from the log rank test okay um can someone tell us how would you interpret this p value if you just saw the p value like that in this plot anyone We talked about this in passing the other day. It was very quick. So this is an opportunity for us to really talk about it briefly. Anyone? How would you interpret the p-value of 0 0.09? Would we say that the survival in the, in the groups are significantly different or not significantly different? It's not significantly Can different. I try, sir? Okay, sorry. I would say that it's not significantly different, yes. So basically that's what, that's what the log rank test does. It just compares the survival across the entire length of the curve and it gives us a p-value. And based on the p-value, we can say whether it's significantly different or not. All right, so. That is the last slide that I have. Thank you very much for staying on and for asking questions and engaging as, as intensively as you have. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. But before we do, I want to announce that we, we are sending out, and if, if you might have seen the email come through, two tasks for you to please complete. One is a quiz that essentially assesses everything that we've taught you you know, um, it's a very short quiz, maybe 10 questions, um, and just checks where you stand. The purpose is for us to see how we have all improved over time, you know, because, you know, there's, we can see that there's a lot of engagement in the class, but there might, this is an opportunity for us to assess each person individually. So if a person's voice is being drowned out, this one is going to help us assess that person. That's one. Um, Two is that we're also sending out a course evaluation where you will tell us what you think about the class, you know, the feedback that you have. Are there ways that you want us to improve the class? So if you're going to recommend this class to someone else, what are the things you would like to see? Um, so, so that's one, one thing. We, we, there's, a, there's a section, so there's questions that we ask you to just fill out, um, make selections of options. And there's, op there's, an, there's opportunity for you to write freely. Tell us what you think. We would really appreciate if you could do that as quickly as possible. And um, we'll look out for your field forms. So I will take any questions that you might have. Someone wants to know whether they will have the recorded video of today's section. Yes, we'll send out the videos as, as soon as we can.
any other any questions? Dr. Motaya, do you have any questions, comments? Sorry, may I ask? Okay. Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Hello, sir. Hello, we can hear you okay. Habib, we can hear you okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask if a repeat of uh, of uh, such program will be coming up because there are a lot of people around me who got to know about it late and wouldn't mind if there will be as in the whole program coming up, maybe another series, sort of. Yeah, so 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 yeah, thanks. Um so what we are thinking that we will do is that we will make the videos available to people. And you know, so very soon we will announce some form of a different format where we'll make the videos available and we might have discussion sections where people can come and ask questions that they have. Right. So it won't be like a full length course the way we have gone through in detail like this, where people will have all the videos for this one. And we will have maybe every month one, one or two hours where they can come, we can go through very quickly, expecting that they would have gone through the videos by then. So that's an option of what we can do. Um, but there's also a possibility that maybe next year we'll do this again. What we're hoping that we can do instead is that now we have had a, a number of people who have taken some of these courses. We've taken people through Epi 101, Stats 101, and we're interested in expanding the content, right? Teaching other materials. So for instance, clinical trials, right? Um, what we're really thinking, what I am thinking that we will do, and uh, depending on if others agree, is that within the next few months, we will develop a, a a course that also that talk, goes into clinical trials in more detail, right? Clinical trials are a good way to learn research methods in practice, right? And we'll, we'll, so if we do, we'll do that, expand into clinical trials and then expand into other things that we think might will help people become better grounded. So rather than reteach this class again in the next so many months, right? We will let people have access to the videos and the people who have access to the videos will be might be able to participate in some discussion sections with us, right? Somebody asked about systematic reviews and meta analysis, so that that's another excellent. So we taught a class in systematic reviews and meta analysis last year March, but I think that we would likely teach it again, right? The reason why we will teach it again is because when we taught that class, a lot of people who participated in the class we don't think that they had had as much grounding in epi and stats as we would have liked, okay? And that's part of the reason why we taught this epi and stats first, and then we'll go back to clinical trials. So the other thing is that if we, so we, we will go to clinical trials and then we will teach, we teach the meta-analysis again. So hopefully when we reteach the meta-analysis again, we will only allow people who have taken the epi and the stats to participate in, in. So basically going forward, we will only allow people who have participated in the previous sessions to be eligible for the subsequent ones, that's one. Or if the person can demonstrate that they, they have enough knowledge to be able to participate maximally and benefit from the class. So the rest of the year, I think that what we would likely do, we will likely have clinical trials and we might have systematic reviews and then maybe one other thing. So it's, un it's unclear yet, but yeah. But for everybody else, we will make the videos available. And if you have friends that um, you think might find it useful, we will make the videos available and then we'll have like discussion sections maybe once a month. So that might be easier for our schedule than to try to reteach this again. People asking about the results of the last assignment. So we, we sent that yesterday, or was it overnight? If you haven't found yours, please send an email and we can look to see what's, what's going on. Okay. Yes, go ahead. 
Okay, so please, um, thank you very much for uh, everything. It's been actually wonderful. Uh, please, uh, we, we, we talked about, I think, was in the first class or so, or whether, yes, or whether I read right, where they said there will be certificates for those who were able to, to do all of the assignments yes. and all that. Yes. Is that still on? That is still on, yes. We will send okay. out. So once we, so the, the final task to be able to be eligible for the certificates will be completing the evaluations, right? The two tasks that we just emailed out today will be required to get the certificates. And everybody who does, who meets the eligibility, whether you have asked for it or not, will send the certificates. And you can choose to do whatever you like. The certificates, if you want it, you can put it on LinkedIn. You know, you can add it to your resume. But I think most importantly is the learning that you can take away from participating in this class. Someone asked if they can keep consulting Stats Clinic after this session, yes. Can reach out to us individually or send an email to the to the Stats Clinic email and and we'll respond as best as we can. Um, so, sorry, so yeah. can I ask for one more favor? Yeah, great. Yes, that we can be able to connect with the tutors on through I mean through social through our social media handles. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can we can share we can share, share. Yes. yeah we can share okay. When there was a student I met yet, the one Mr. Bass, I don't know if I can connect with him. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, so I think one of the things that we struggled with, uh, that, that's an interesting point, with, with the design of the class was that we really wanted a way for students to be able to connect with each other, but yeah. we weren't able to do that. I think that what we might do going forward is that we will require everybody to use um, Gmail to register for the class and we will probably use classrooms at Google. So Google has Google classrooms where it can allow chats outside of class, right? Among, among students and with the group, it can allow, it will be one place to manage the class. You know, we considered using it here but it was too close to when we started the class and we didn't want to introduce a new system. But I think that one of the things that we'll spend time doing is figuring it out and requiring people use Gmail. And the other reason we didn't do that was because of the Gmail requirement. But it seems that it will make life so much easier. Everybody who is joining the class has a Gmail account and you know we can use Google Classroom to, to manage the class. Someone wants to know about upcoming labs and sessions. Yes, so we will. So one, one, one thing that we do with, with the registrations from the classes that we are creating a sort of network. And every time we have a new class, we will send out emails to the people who have participated in the previous classes. So if you're, if, when we're announcing the next class, we'll email you guys first, right? And give you a few days head start before we announce the public. So. Once we announce an, um, a, a new class, if you think you're interested, we want you to register first. You know, register for the class as quickly as you can so that you can secure space. So that if we then decide that we're not going to be able to take more than a few people, you know, you won't have, you won't have been locked out, so to speak. All right. Any other comments, questions? Yes, I, yes, I want to say something. Yeah. The AP101, most of some of us, as of then, I think, as of then, some of us have not really, I think I didn't know about this yep. in AP101. Yeah. So uh, for the start, I think I started from the word go. So I don't know if that would be, that would be a very good um, yardstick to use and judge all of what's in your subsequent uh, Classes, yeah, yeah. yeah so what, what we will do, I think what we will do, because I, I think that it's important for people to have that Epi 101 grounding, to be able to move forward to a lot of things that we, that we teach. What we'll do is that we will release the videos to you guys. It's not very long. It was just four classes, you know, um, but it went very quickly into the design of research studies. So my sense is that it's something that you can sit down over a weekend 
and just dive into and, and be done with. So we will likely have a virtual option for the Stats 101. No, not a virtual, like a self-paced version of the Stats 101 class and the Epi 101 class over the next several weeks, we'll, we'll announce that. And we will encourage you to take that so that when we then come back later to do the clinical trials and the systematic reviews, you'll be ready for that. Yeah, asynchronous session, very good. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate the time that you have taken week in, week in, week out. Hello, so, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Some of, some of us got to know through, uh, got to know about this program through friends. Maybe we were sent the link. And how do we continue to link up with you after this uh, session? Is yes. it through the email or there's a particular WhatsApp group or Telegram group where you gathered all of us? Um, so so we, we think that email is probably best. Yeah. Um, so we, as much as possible, one concern that we've had with WhatsApp groups is that, you know, like it's going to involve like creating, there's a privacy of everybody. As much as possible, one thing you will notice is that we have tried not to circulate people's emails with others unless it happens inadvertently. You know, um, we have tried not to share phone numbers such that, you know, if people are going to do it themselves then it's up to them. But I think that when we go into the next set where we will maybe use Classroom, Google Classroom, it will be easier to manage and you can directly ask for contacts that you think you need. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we will look out for your emails and for your response to the forms and hope to see you in future sessions. Sir, so, thank you very much for the classes. We really want to thank you because you've added them um, so much uh, to our knowledge and uh, for me that uh, I'm having a proposal that, that I fear the analysis, interpreting the analysis, at least you valid my fear. Yep. Uh, um, I, for the EPI, you said you're going to EPI 101 because I didn't get to know about it. You said you're going to send the link for us, right? Yeah, so we will announce an asynchronous course that would allow you to do it at your own pace, right? Okay. It will be videos, then, uh, like, it will be slides. Yes. Okay. Yep. Then, like, uh, how long is uh, the next uh, set coming up? So that at least whatever I want to fill up, because uh, most of the R labs, I just downloaded the video to watch it on my own because of my hands are filled. So yeah. I want to know so that at least before then, I will have taken time to go through the R labs and what have you, so that I will fit it into the, the next analysis classes and what have you. Yes. Yeah. It will. It will likely take. A, a while maybe two months because you know um we will have to develop the slides so we, we have to develop the slides from scratch and all that so my sense is that sometime in september we will announce the next set the next session and then maybe it will be in october that that's that's i think is likely to be the earliest possible when we will do the next course Okay, and then yep. what's the turnaround time you expected for the last two mails that you said uh, you're going to send to us? I think as soon as you can, maybe if you can do it in one week, that's great. Um, it, it, it won't take a long time. If you sit down in 20 minutes, you'll be done, right? So okay. the earliest you can do it, the best, the better for everybody. My sense is that by in one week's time, we'll check to see how many people have done it, and then we'll decide how to move forward. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for all the comments and um, kind words. We, we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah.
Please uh, share your social media handle so and the rest mm -hmm. of the team. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, all right.